Good evening. Uh, Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1, and tonight we'll start in verse 20. And we'll finish up the first chapter. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20. Solomon teaches his son, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. But because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way, and have their fill of their own devices." For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and be at ease without dread of disaster. Let us pray together. Our righteous Father, thank you for this word that you have preserved from your servant Solomon. Father, help us to turn at the reproof of wisdom. Help us, Father, to not refuse the wisdom that you offer us uh, through your Proverbs, through your Word. Father, we seek to be uh, better servants in your kingdom. We seek to be remade after the image of your Son. And Father, uh, we know that wisdom is one with you and your Son, that you are the source of wisdom. And Father... um, Because we want to be good servants in your kingdom, because we love you and confess you as our Lord, we do not wish to be fools. We don't wish to be faithless like the men that we read of in our text tonight. So, Father, I pray that you pour your Spirit out on us and make your words known to us. And, Father... Uh, You have already begun to accomplish this in your Son, Jesus. Thank you for sending Him to live among us, uh, to die for us, and to be raised in newness of life, that we also have that hope, uh, that just as He was the first fruits of the resurrection, we shall join Him in the resurrection. It's in Jesus' name that we offer our prayer. Amen. So this morning, we talked about the fathers, uh, the wise fathers' first lesson for his son, that it was not to be greedy for unjust gain. That is, whenever you consider that from the perspective of the prophets and the law, what that means is to be generous to the poor, to the needy, the widow, the orphan, the sojourner. Well, the wise father pivots from that first lesson to talk about just some general outcomes of wisdom and of folly. He's kind of he's laying out the lay of the land, so to speak, showing us how the world works. Because that's how a wisdom works in Scripture. It is mostly observational. Wisdom is something like an early form of science. Uh, you know, science is, in a lot of ways, descriptive rather than prescriptive. You watch what's going on, you notice patterns, and you describe those patterns. And the wisdom of Scripture is often like that. In fact, think of how often that's repeated in Ecclesiastes, how Kohelet, uh, the preacher, the teacher, uh, says, I have seen or I have observed how things work this way or that way. Uh, this is a, it's an early form of science, uh, but it's given prescriptively because the world works in this way. Here's the way you ought to live. 
Friends, because the world works this way, be wise so that you can succeed. Because if you're foolish, you're running counter to the way God has created the world and you're only going to meet disaster. Anyway, we started looking at this a little bit last week as we considered some of the promises that are made in, say, Proverbs chapter 3, uh, what good you get out of wisdom. Uh, what I want us to do is spend some time focusing on these outcomes. What, uh, what Solomon teaches us we should expect out of wisdom and folly. Uh, and... As we're doing this, I want us to draw a lot of connections between what he teaches here and what he has taught uh, and what we learn in other places in Scripture. And the first thing I want us to turn our attention to is the way that he pivots from that first lesson about uh, those who are greedy for unjust gain, uh, from that lesson into this lesson, the text that we just read uh, because it's almost as if he just breaks from one right into the other. But what he's doing, I think, is establishing a contrast. Because notice what the greedy men do in this, from this morning's reading. Uh, if you go back up to verse 11, uh, these sinners who are trying to entice the son. Uh, Solomon teaches, if they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. What we read about these greedy men is that they're lying in wait. Uh, they're like, you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, how that starts out. Uh, that there's this man traveling down the road and he's beset by robbers on the road. Which is a, unfortunately a common occurrence in the ancient world. You're out in the wilderness, essentially in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's going to stop you. And... Uh, these, uh, that's typically where these sorts of encounters would happen. They're going to be hiding off to the, you know, the side of the road, and as somebody passes by, they jump out, hold them up, beat them up, take their stuff. So these greedy men are lying in wait, probably by the roadside, ready to ambush somebody. Their victims, ideally, you know, from their perspective, their victims won't know what hit them. Wisdom, on the other hand, What's wisdom doing? Wisdom cries aloud in the street. Right, these men greedy for, uh, for unjust gain are hiding off in the hedges, waiting to jump on people in the road. Wisdom is standing in the middle of the road crying out. She's not hidden. She's out in the open declaring her plans, declaring precisely what she is going to do. Nobody should be surprised by what she does. Now, as we read, some people are going to pretend they're surprised. They're going to act like, oh, I didn't know that this lifestyle would lead me into these sorts of consequences. And wisdom says, oh, no, you knew. I warned you. I'm going to laugh at you now. That's what wisdom says. I mean, what a contrast this is between wisdom and folly that Solomon has drawn for us. There is, by the way, a, an implicit promise here to those of us who are seeking wisdom. If we are earnestly going after wisdom and asking God for wisdom, look at the descriptions, the nature of wisdom and folly. Folly uh, is all about subtlety and sneakiness. Wisdom is drastically different. Wisdom is out in the open and wisdom is fairly plain. And so the implicit promise here is that wisdom and folly, you know, in truth, don't look anything alike. Uh, that as we are pursuing wisdom... And as God is blessing us with wisdom, we should be able to discern the difference between wisdom and folly. It's not some sort of secret knowledge that only the elite have access to. Right? But it is something that, I mean, wisdom is making this call out in the marketplace, out in the city gates, free access to wisdom. Any sort of confusion that exists between the two in our minds is a symptom of our own simplicity, which we'll talk about in just a minute, what we mean by simplicity. 
if we're wise or if we are becoming wise, the contrast should be apparent. And this is a great promise. Because think of how many people live out in the world according to worldly principles and run around like chickens with their heads cut off. Like they have no idea what's going on. They don't know how to decide what's right and what's wrong. They agonize over things because they have no basis for making decisions. And they're convinced, a lot of people today are convinced, that they just completely lack the ability to know anything for certain. You find uncertainty everywhere in our culture today. And what Solomon is telling us about wisdom here is that it's something you don't have to agonize over. Not in, not in the sense that a you know, worldly postmodern has to agonize over it. Wisdom is out there crying out. It is freely available. And what is wisdom crying out? What is wisdom declaring in the middle of the street? She gives us a couple of messages, one about the wise and one about those who are simple and those who are foolish. She has a very brief message for the wise. In verse 23, If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. That is, if you heed wisdom... If you learn from it, if you are in the process of becoming wise, wisdom says, I'll pour out my spirit to you and I'll make my words known to you. All right, now that's all she has to say about wisdom in this context, this immediate context. The, the wise father, Solomon, as he's teaching his son, is going to have more to say about this, the promises of seeking wisdom. And he's going to talk about that later on, mostly in chapters 2 and 3. Uh, we'll, we'll return to that later. For now, before we consider the rest of what wisdom is crying out in the middle of the street, I just want us to tuck this away in, the, uh, in our minds. The way that wisdom describes her rewards... I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. And I want you to consider just for a second. We'll come back to this. But consider, while we're away from this part of the text, do those rewards sound familiar to you? Do these words in chapter 23, or sorry, in verse 23, sound familiar to you? I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. So we'll come back to that. But wisdom herself really doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking about uh, the good things that you get from listening to her. She spends most of her time out in the middle of the street threatening ruin on fools and simpletons. In fact, that's how she begins her speech in verse 22. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? All right, in the promises of verse 23, uh, they're not even really focused at the wise. Uh, they're held out as a, a sort of, of rescue. All right, those of you who are simple, those of you who are foolish, look at what you could have. If only you would turn to me, wisdom says. I'll pour out my spirit to you and make my words known to you. But because I've called to you and you refuse to listen, have, I've stretched out my hand and no one is heeded. Because you've ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. All right, the message, the whole thing, is directed at the people that wisdom addresses as simple ones. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? And scoffers or fools. How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Now, I want to, before we go any further, talk about the simple and the fool in Proverbs. Because this is, these are two concepts that are going to come up constantly in the book of Proverbs. The fool, obviously. I mean, we talk about the fool all the time. Uh, the, the, the Proverbs talk about the fool constantly. 
And often, the Proverbs seem to put the simple and the fool in parallel with each, with each other, as if they're the same kind of person. Uh, we've seen it once already. Go down to verse 32. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. It almost seems like... Uh, the Proverbs are, are putting those in parallel, like they're the same kind of person. And so sometimes we talk about the Proverbs as addressing just two distinct types of people, the wise and the foolish. And that's the, that's the contrast that's drawn throughout the book of Proverbs. And that's, that's mostly right. You look at most of the Proverbs and they'll draw that contrast. The wise man does this, but the fool does that. Or they'll flip it around. The fool does this, but the wise man does the other thing. But the Proverbs, as we study through, we'll find actually sometimes addresses a third type of person. Uh, not just the wise and the fool, but what is here referred to as the simple. Uh, that whenever the Proverbs talk about the simple, we're actually talking about a distinct class of person other than the fool. Uh, and we find this distinction later in the book. Turn to chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. Verse 11, I think this proverb uh, gives us a pretty good understanding of this distinction. Proverbs 21, verse 11. When a scoffer is punished, the simple becomes wise. When a wise man is instructed, he gains knowledge. So, how do these different types of people respond to instruction and respond to other people being instructed. Now, we've already read in the Proverbs that fools despise wisdom and instruction. That is the hallmark of the fool in Proverbs, is you can't teach him. He refuses to be taught. And by definition, that's what makes him the fool. Uh, that he will not accept instruction. And so he's constantly going his own way, making stupid mistakes, chasing wickedness, uh, being quick to evil, because he won't be taught. But what's happening here in Proverbs 21.11? When a scoffer is punished, that is, whenever one of these fools, one of these people that can't be taught, whenever he is punished, the simple becomes wise. That is, this, this simple man is watching whenever the scoffer is punished. And he sees what happens to the scoffer on account of his scoffing. And seeing that becomes a little more wise. I mean, anybody who's had, you know, two or more kids has seen this in play. Right? One of the siblings gets in trouble and sometimes you can watch the other sibling watching. Right? This, this used to drive, like, Holly nuts whenever she was a kid because her brother was really good at watching her get in trouble. Um, I never ever got in trouble, so I can't say anything about that. Um, but, and you see this in the classroom too. Um, you know, I, I taught for six years before we moved down here. And you could see this play out in pretty much every classroom. In every classroom, you have basically three types of students. You've got the ones that are willing to learn, whom the Proverbs would call the wise. You have the ones that are not willing to learn. They are only there because they have to be there. To them, school is uh, basically no better than prison. Right? That is the way that they look at school. And functionally, that's what school is to them. They are only there because they have to be there. And whenever they release, they run out with joy. They're not there to learn. Uh, any sort of learning that gets into their heads gets in by accident. But in the middle, and anybody that's taught kids has seen this, in the middle, you've got what the Proverbs calls the simpleton or the simple. The one that's not committed in either direction. Uh, the one who doesn't know enough yet. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a, I think, a useful parallel that's drawn in the first chapter. If you go back to Proverbs chapter 1, 
uh, when we're looking at the purposes of the Proverbs, look at what Solomon puts in parallel in verse 4. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. That's what Proverbs are supposed to do. To give prudence to the simple, to give knowledge and discretion to the youth. And if as a parallelism we, we mean these to mean the same thing, that the simpleton and the youth are essentially the same kind of person, then what we're looking at is somebody who, you know, somebody's just ignorant, somebody just doesn't know better. They're not committed either direction yet. Fools are usually presented as committed to folly. I know as stupid as that sounds, uh, they have at some point made the choice, I am going to reject whatever other people tell me, and I'm going to pursue my own way, whatever looks good to me, that's what I'm going to do. The fool is committed to folly. The simpleton is kind of standing between the wise and the fool and watching to see how things go. Again, you see this with with kids all the time. You see it in the classroom. Uh, You've got that big chunk of students that if you don't manage your classroom well and you let the one or two scoffers in the crowd get away with things, you lose the middle. Right? If you let the if you let the extreme, if you let the verge get away with with whatever they're trying to get away with, you lose the middle. Uh, the simple realizes there's no punishment for doing this, that, or the other thing, and they have no inclination towards wisdom, and they're going to get away with whatever they they think is fun, um, which is why. At least the the administrator who was was teaching me to be a teacher whenever I first started out said, "Look, this this is the way it works, and this is why you've got to squash this stuff. If you have a scoffer in your class, don't don't give him an inch, because like it says in Proverbs twenty one eleven, whenever the scoffer is punished, the simple becomes wise. Uh, the middle." You know, those, those students that aren't committed to wisdom or to folly, they see you're not going to put up with folly. And they kind of toe the line. And this, that's basically the distinction here. The fool hates instruction. The simpleton can be instructed. Now, as we see in the Proverbs, being teachable is not the same as being wise. So unless this this person, this simple person, actually receives instruction, but what is the natural path of the simple man to become a fool? The default path of the simpleton is to turn into a fool. Which is why wisdom addresses both of them. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Well, we learn in chapter 14 to confirm this. Chapter 14 and verse 18. The simple inherit folly. That's what they have waiting for them. That is the fruit of their simplicity. It's not like they're innocent. We don't mean simple in that sense. We just mean unformed. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. And so for the simple man, the task is to start gaining wisdom so that you don't fall into folly. Thus, wisdom calls out her warning to the simpleton and to the fool. Because if you ignore wisdom, then your calamity will come on you and wisdom will have no pity on you. Look at wisdom's warnings again in Proverbs chapter 1. She warns, Because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. They will call upon me, but I will not 
answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Now, just like we should have heard something familiar in verse 23 with those promises, I'll pour out my spirit to you, I'll make my words known to you. We should also be hearing something familiar in the threat, the way that wisdom makes this threat against the simple and against the fool. If they don't listen, calamity is going to come upon them. And they're going to call on wisdom, and wisdom is going to react to that call. That should sound, all of this should sound familiar to us. Because what Solomon has chosen to do with wisdom is he has laid out wisdom's address largely in the same way that the prophets address Israel. And we're going to continue to notice these parallels between the wisdom and the prophets. Uh, Solomon is heavily, heavily influenced by prophetic ways of thinking. Uh, Turn to Joel chapter 2. I want us to notice some parallels here. Let's start with the promises. Go to the prophet Joel chapter 2. And we're going to read a little bit of Joel that is quoted uh, in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So having said that, you may know what passage I have in mind. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Remember what wisdom promised to those who turn and heed her instruction. Here's what the Lord says through the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. But this is God's covenant promise to His people. This is how God claims His people as His people, that He pours out His Spirit on them. All right, that was the sign on the day of Pentecost. How do we know that God is choosing the church, Uh, that God is naming the church His people? Because everybody saw God's Spirit poured out. They saw men and heard men speaking in tongues, speaking languages that they didn't know, know, that the speakers didn't know, but which the audience knew. You've got this evidence that the Lord has poured out His Spirit. And it's fulfilling this promise. That's what Peter tells us in Acts chapter 2. And what... Solomon has wisdom say, part of what he has wisdom say, is if you turn to me, I will pour out my spirit to you. In other words, wisdom's going to, wisdom's laying a, a covenant claim on people who follow her. And by extension, you know, the God who gives us wisdom is laying out this covenant claim. Right, that Again, if you want to be part of the covenant, if you want to be a follower of God, you have to pursue wisdom. Right, think of what else she says. Besides that she's going to pour out her spirit, uh, wisdom also says, I will make my words known to you, uh, which sounds an awful lot like, well, we, we read this in various places in the prophets, but I think particularly of Jeremiah 31 and the promise of a new covenant. Remember what makes the new covenant so unique and so distinct, so different from the old covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke... Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, 
And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. All right, but part of the promise of the new covenant is that this, this law permeates us, this covenant permeates us, that it is given to us as Lady Wisdom says, I will make my words known to you. This is another covenant claim that she's laying down. That you will enjoy blessings just as you would enjoy blessings for keeping the covenant if you listen to me, if you turn at my reproof, she says. The promises of wisdom are the promises of the covenant. But we also hear the threats of folly echoed in the prophets and in the broader history of Israel. All right, whenever she goes through this uh, this sequence of, of events, people ignore wisdom, and so they fall into calamity, they're punished for it, and they cry out for deliverance, and then there's a reaction to that cry. All of this is a play on what we sometimes call the sin cycle. All right, this is something that you notice very, very early on in Israel's history, starting from uh, Judges in particular. Uh, the whole book of Judges is just running through this cycle over and over and over again. And by the time you get to the prophets, God says, I'm done doing this over and over again. But here's how it, here's how it goes. God establishes His people. I think that's how the beginning of Judges goes. Uh, the people are con- finished conquering the land. They're settling in the promised land. So God establishes His people. They forget Him and abandon His law, abandon the covenant, and begin to act wickedly. So He punishes them. He delivers them over to the hands of their enemies. And they cry out for help because of their oppression. And He hears them and He delivers them. All right, and then you just do that whole thing on repeat again. After the deliverance, he establishes them. After they get established, they forget him again and begin to act wickedly. He punishes them again. They cry out for help again. And he delivers them again. And as you read through Judges, this happens over and over and over and over. Until by the point you get to the prophets, you find that this whole thing is turned into a farce on the part of God's people. Which is why what wisdom say looks different in a key way. Because in Judges, the cycle always goes that after the punishment, the people cry out for help and God hears them and answers their cry. He will send one of the judges, usually, uh, to deliver them out of the hand of the Philistines or you know whichever enemy is ruling over them at the time. Uh, just depending on that, that point in history. But he always hears and he delivers. Notice what wisdom says. Then they will call upon me, verse 28, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof, therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. Wisdom's threat is is different in a very important way. She says she's not going to hear their cry. She's not going to hear the cry of the fool. She's not going to deliver him from the consequences of his folly. This tells us a few things. First off, this tells us that life in God's covenant is good. I think sometimes we don't recognize how good we have it being part of God's people. Because remember, wisdom wisdom is descriptive. It talks about the way the world naturally works, the way God created the world. All right, we read later on in Proverbs that God created the world through wisdom. All right, we read that in Proverbs chapter 8. All 
And so the natural way of the world, the way the world works, is essentially you get what you deserve. (coughs) You eat the fruit of your way. Whatever you plant, that's what's going to grow. You know, and we have all sorts of, you know, our own proverbs to describe this. You know, if you make your bed, you have to lie in it, right? That's the natural way of things. But God, in His mercy, often intervenes for His people. Whenever His people fall astray and they realize it and repent and cry out, God is faithful to hear them. The universe is not going to hear them. Wisdom says, I'm just going to sit there and laugh because you're a fool. You deserve every inch of what you've gotten here. Every bit of it. The universe does not care. God does Because He is just, and He is merciful, and He loves us. This also tells us something really important about folly. Because wisdom is responding to folly here. This is a reaction to fools. And I think it's important the way that Solomon has presented this in Proverbs 1. Because in Israel's history, we typically find two kinds of covenant unfaithfulness. Uh, There's the sin cycle, which we talked about, which is basically correctable faithlessness. The idea is that the people are not so far gone that they can't be corrected. In other words, they're instructable. And so the Lord punishes them and they learn their lesson and they cry out to the Lord in penitence and the Lord hears them and delivers them. The Lord relents. He is not judging them strictly, at least not in the, in the final sense. He is punishing them, but He's punishing them because He expects them to get better on account of the punishment. And we see that happen in the book of Judges. Again, you know, Israel's uh, history, in terms of, you know, like their faithfulness is just all over the place. It's up and down. Which is why it runs through a cycle like that. But there's another type of faithfulness, or sorry, faithlessness that we see in Israel's history. A fatal kind of faithlessness, one that cannot be corrected and against which the Lord will not relent. And unsurprisingly, we find it in the prophets. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 11. Remember we said this whole sin cycle, it basically turned into a farce by the time of the prophets. Not a farce on God's part but a farce on Israel's part. Israel had no longer hit the point where they would repent on account of their suffering, on account of their punishment. You know, it's the difference between somebody who is genuinely sorry that they did something bad versus somebody who's only sorry that they got caught. Right again. If you've ever had kids, you've seen, you've seen that difference. You know when some way they are genuinely like they feel bad about what they did, versus they just feel bad that you caught them and that they're getting in trouble for it. Right, that's a bad heart issue. And Israel, in the course of its history, developed that heart issue, and it became fatal to them. In Jeremiah chapter eleven. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Listen to my voice, and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as at this day. Or notice everything that the Lord is saying here is stuff that we have heard wisdom say. Listen! Just listen! Do what you are instructed! 
And she gives these covenant promises. I'll pour my spirit out on you. I'll make you to know my words. She lays these covenant claims on us. And God does exactly the same thing here. Here is the covenant. Hear the words that I commanded your fathers. Listen to my voice. Do all that I command you. So shall you be my people and I will be your God. All right, and Jeremiah answers, so be it, Lord. And the Lord said to me in verse 6, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently, even to this day, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did not. Again the Lord said to me, A conspiracy exists among the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned their back... Sorry, they have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster upon them that they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they make offerings, but they cannot save them in the time of their trouble. For your gods have become as your cities, O Judah, and as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars that are set up to shame, altars to make offerings to Baal. Therefore do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf. For I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done so many vile deeds? Can even sacrificial flesh avert your doom? Can you then exult? The Lord once called you a green olive tree, beautiful with good fruit. But with the roar of a great tempest, he will set fire to it, and its branches will be consumed. The Lord of hosts who planted you has decreed disaster upon you because of the evil that the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done, provoking me to anger by making offerings to Baal. And here the Lord is mirroring wisdom's words. We're used to the Lord hearing. We're used to the Lord relenting. Then the prophets, often the the main message is, I'm done hearing. I'm not going to hear you anymore. I'm not going to relent this time. You are done. Because the difference is that Israel early on violated the covenant. But again, they were correctable. They would repent and they would come back. Israel and Judah, late in the kingdom, didn't just violate the covenant, they broke the covenant. They were done with it first. They walked away from it. They refused to listen to God. And so God gave them up. He said, fine, if you don't want to be part of the covenant, then don't be part of the covenant. Don't enjoy the blessings of the covenant. Enjoy its curses instead. Get what you deserve and see how you do with that. And that's precisely what happens to Judah. And that's precisely what happens to Israel. And it is telling, I think, that Solomon chooses that part of Israel's history to mirror whenever he's talking about folly. He doesn't say foolishness is like early Israel. Well, you're just you're just making kind of an innocent mistake, and you know you're not completely turning your back on the Lord. You're correctable. You know the the wisdom will hear you whenever you cry out, and you'll be snatched out of the fire. Everything will be okay. Solomon doesn't say that's the way it's going to be. The way folly is is it is final. Whatever bad happens to you, happens to you on account of your folly. 
because he compares you to faithless Israel, the covenant breakers at the end of their kingdom. Ignoring wisdom, Solomon tells us, is like the worst kind of covenant faithlessness. The wisdom is not some light matter. It's not the optional stuff at the back of your Gideon's New Testament. Right? It's not the stuff that you can choose to ignore because it's kind of loosey goosey and there's not, you know, hard and fast rules. Uh, but a lot of it is, is deciding and discerning what is right and wrong. Now, Solomon tells us here this is deadly serious. This is not the optional stuff. This is not the little league stuff. But thankfully, the Lord is not stingy with his wisdom. Again, notice what wisdom is doing. She's crying out in the middle of the street. She's crying out in the marketplace. She's crying out at the city gate. She is freely available to anyone who will avail themselves of her. James puts it another way in James chapter 1. And remember, it's wisdom that James appeals to. When he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Alright, well, how do you get there? Well, if any of you lacks wisdom, in other words, if you don't have what it takes to endure these trials, to allow the testing of your faith to produce steadfastness, what you need, James says, is wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The Lord is not stingy with his wisdom to those who truly seek it, who seek it in faith. So as we've noted, what I want to conclude with, one of the central teachings of the Proverbs is that people generally get what they deserve. The wise and the upright are blessed. The foolish and the wicked are cursed. And we understand from our perspective, being in the church, that Blessings and curses are more than just physical stuff. You know, we might look around at the world around us and it seems like the wicked are flourishing. It almost always turns out to be a lie, though. Right? This happens every once in a while. You'll hear in the news about some celebrity whose life just suddenly implodes. You know, they've been going for years and it seems like things are going very, very well for them. They seem to be very successful and happy and rotten all at the same time. And then all of a sudden, they just, they fall apart. And it happens over and over and over again. And what you learn from all of the exposés that follow afterwards, because that's how newspapers make their money, What you learn afterwards is that all along, this guy's life was a total and complete mess. Yeah, he's got 40 bajillion dollars, and people throw themselves at him and do whatever he asks, but he is miserable, has never been happy, is full of dysfunction, and it eventually all just catches up to him and he collapses. But we know that blessings and curses are more than just physical stuff, but spiritual reality. And that is God's promise to us. That if we are faithful to seek Him and to seek His wisdom, He'll bless us. That He will bless us with wisdom. And that He will bless us through His Son to eternal life. And so let us seek wisdom with all our hearts and never turn away from it because we know that the results are fatal. 
Brother Keith has selected number 812, All Things Are Ready. What it means is that we always stand ready to receive people into the fold. The invitation of God is always open, just as the invitation to receive wisdom is always open. It may be that you're here and you have not repented of your sin, confessed Jesus as Lord, and been baptized into His death, burial, and resurrection, and that you need to remedy that. Again, the promises of the covenant are great. Life outside the covenant is pretty rotten. Or it may be that having joined the way, you have fallen away from it and are in need of restoration. Whatever your need may be, we stand ready to help you. If it will make your need known by coming forward, as together we stand and sing.